Hello, everybody. I want to talk to you today about prescription for peace. Just a talk on peace of mind and how to get it. From the scriptures, of course, Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4. Here's what it says, and I want to play with the Hebrew of this text for a little bit before we dive into the, the message itself. But here's what it says. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast. Now, this is the NIV, of course. Because he trusts in you. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord, is the rock eternal. Now, just to push these around a little bit, in the Hebrew it says, you will keep in shalom, shalom. In other words, a perfect peace is double shalom. Shalom now and forever. Him whose mind is, King James says, stayed on you. Pardon me, but I prefer that to this. Stayed on you. Nailed and fixed in you. Because he trusts in you. He's rolled his life over on you. And he says, roll your life over on me forever. For the Lord, the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Yah, Yahweh. <laughs> the Lord now and evermore is the rock eternal. The Hebrew says, the rock of ages. I want to be on the rock of ages, don't you? I believe that that's the key prescription for peace. Now, let's introduce this. One of the greatest lessons I am still in the process of learning <laughs> is this one. Peace is not the absence of something. It's the presence of something. It's not the absence of war or trouble or strife or any of those things. You can have all of those things crowding in on you and still have peace. Shalom, shalom. Because shalom means wholeness. And you see, it's not dependent upon outward circumstances or invasive situations. It means fullness. And it means completeness. So you see, it's a positive quality, not a negative one. You don't have to get rid of anything, get out of anything to have real shalom, shalom. Peace with God. Now, because we don't have it, our society has learned how to manufacture synthetic peace. And we all know about these, don't we? Uh, one of them is a military peace. The Romans did this. They called it the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. But it was a peace of force. It was a piece of external control. Uh, it was based on fear and total obedience without freedom. We've done that. We've tried that. We've put ourselves under all kinds of things, haven't we? Thinking if we can just do this and behave that way and and not do this or not do that, I'll have peace. It doesn't work. It might work for a while, but it's synthetic. It will wear out. Then there's a chemical piece. <laughs> How well do we know about that one? This is the piece of drugs. Sedation. Let me check out right now. Let me turn off and tune in and drop out, as they said back in the 60s, and wait for a better tomorrow. 
Things will get better. I'll just check out for now and join the fight again later. That doesn't work. It makes matters worse, in fact. Then there's another one that's fascinating. And this is the piece of amusement. Amusement. Ah means not, and muse means think. So stop thinking. Fill your life with fun. Run here and do that and all of the other kinds of activity so that you don't have to think. We know about that synthetic piece too, don't we? And then a fourth one that comes to my mind is the piece of prosperity. This is based on buy. Buy it. Fill your life up with stuff. <laughs> I remember one time I was in South Florida down in Miami, Fort Lauderdale area. And I talked to a very wonderful man who was a multi, multi-millionaire. He didn't know how much money he had. And it, it just didn't, he didn't pay it any mind because he never needed to. And I remember out behind his palatial home, he took me to show me his cars. And he had Maseratis and Porsches and, and Cadillacs and Rolls Royces and all kinds of, of cars out there, that really, that had 20, 30, 50 miles on them. And he had 38 of them in a great big warehouse of a, of, of behind his house. And I said, why in the world did you buy all these things? Uh, was it pride of ownership? And he thought for a moment and with a wry smile on his face, he, he said, well, preacher, I'm a little bit embarrassed to tell you this, but it, I don't have any pride of ownership on those. He said, really, it was pride of purchase. Just being able at the moment to buy it. And I bought it. I mean, all kinds of money tied up in that garage. He drove one of them. And sometimes he'd drive a different one. But usually he drove the, the Cadillac um, a limo or the uh, a Porsche around town, and the rest of them just sat there and gathered dust. All of these things, manufactured peace, we see them everywhere, synthetic, not real. So let's come to three things today. Number one, the producer of peace. All real peace is a gift from God. You can't buy it, you can't earn it, uh, you can't make it happen. Peace is the result of the quality of our relationship with God. I want to go to the Bible, of course, and uh, pull out some scriptures on peace and just briefly look at them one after another. Psalm 29 verse 11 is one. It says, the Lord gives strength to his people. We, we do get weak along the way, and we need God's strength. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. So what is peace? It's, it's the absence of strength. Or, or, uh, yeah, it's the presence of strength and the absence of weakness. It's, it's strength in the middle of weakness. The Lord pours shalom, shalom into us when we have a sense of weakness. Psalm 119, verse 165. Now, you've got to go a long ways into the Psalms to find the 165th verse of a chapter. Here's what it says. Great peace have they who love your law. Now, the King James says law, but the Hebrew says your Torah. Now, you say, well, Torah is the Hebrew word for law, isn't it? No, it's only one of many words that are translated law in the King James, and it doesn't mean law in the sense of rules and regulations. It means lifestyle. 
Great peace have they who love your lifestyle, who live with you and in you and on your terms, and nothing can make them stumble. Wow. So peace is strength and weakness. It is also direction, comfort, blessing in trouble. Now look at Isaiah, the great, great prophet. Isaiah 48, 18 and 19. He says, if only you had paid attention to my commands. Isaiah is speaking now in God's stead. If only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river. Wow. Peace like a river incessant, continually flowing, even in trouble, even in need, even in want, even in fear. That river, that underground river keeps on flowing. That's the promise of God. But this verse doesn't end there. It begins there. Your peace would have been like a river. Your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Wow. Now righteousness, it's, not a, it's a religious word to us, but in, in the Bible it means rightness with God. In other words, your openness with God, look at this, would be like the waves of the sea. Have, have you ever walked um, at night uh, with a tide out? after thousands of people have been on a beach and you see all kinds of debris and, and plastic and all kinds of junk everywhere, you say, ooh, what an ugly beach. But you come back the next morning. The tide has come in and the waves of the sea have reached in and taken all that ugliness and all that worthlessness and all that debris and it washed it, and the beach is pristine and clear. Even the holes and the diggings and all of that, plain and flat and clean and clear. Ah, if you'd have paid attention to my way of life, he said, your peace would have been running like a river, and it would clean the debris out of your life like the waves of the sea. And look at this. He doesn't even stop there. He says, and your descendants, your children, your grandchildren would have been like the sand on that beach. Your children like its numberless grains. Their name would never be cut off nor destroyed from before me. You see, they would pick up who and what you are, not what you say, not even what you do, but who you are would go into them. Your DNA would go into them. Your godly DNA, that peace like a river that cleanses you when you make your mistakes, they catch it and their name would live forever. Jesus said something about this peace too in John 14, 27. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives and then takes back. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Look at that. My peace. The peace that Jesus walked in is available to us. <laughs> wow. The producer of peace. That's God. One more passage. John 16, Again, this from the lips of Jesus. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome 
the world. You see then, peace is not the absence of trouble. It's the fullness of the grace of God, regardless of the circumstances. And before we leave this point, can we listen to Paul for just a bit? Romans 5.1, Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, because we have come into a right relationship with God by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in 8.6 of Romans, he says, The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. Shalom, shalom, fullness, wholeness, completeness. Ephesians 2.14, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility. Peace. I could go on and on and on because both Jesus and Paul talked more about peace than just about anything else in the world. The producer of peace. Now what about the pathway to peace? If the producer of the peace is God, then what is the pathway of peace? Look at our text again in the NIV. It says, your mind must be steadfast, stayed on him. See, that simply means fixed or focused. It doesn't mean always like a monk in a cell, flagellating your body so that your mind can stay on him. That's not what it means at all. Nowhere in the Bible is monasticism glorified. We, we live our real relationship with God culturally, socially, among people, not off in a cave somewhere. Here's what this says. Your mind must be steadfast, that is fixed, Focused. In other words, the quality of your life will never rise higher than the quality of your thinking. The quality of your life will never rise higher than the quality of your thinking. Here's the way Hebrews puts it. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. That writer says... And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let's not give up meeting together as, sons are in, as some are in the habit of doing. But let's encourage one another. And all the more so as you see the day approaching. You know, a major goal of corporate worship is to keep our minds fixed on the Lord. It's just to keep that awareness of whose we are in our consciousness. It it doesn't have to come out in our vocabulary all the time, in our conversation and speech, but we walk in Him. We think about Him. We consult him on major issues in our lives. I heard someone say the other day that the problem with the church is so many of us have spiritual ADD, attention deficit disorder. We forget whose we are. And we just try to to deal with life in our own terms and not not in his terms. The difference between faith and fear is what you look at, what you focus on. Matthew 14 gives a story about focus. 
the disciples were in a storm on the Sea of Galilee. And all of a sudden, as they were battling the waves and trying to stay afloat, and I've been on the Sea of Galilee many times, and I've been in a boat similar, undoubtedly, to the one they were in. It was a transport boat that took you from one side of the Galilee to the other. And I've done that many times. And so I have an idea of exactly what was going on with those men in that boat. They were struggling. Now, they were fishermen. They knew how to handle a boat. But all of a sudden, they looked up and they saw Jesus walking on the water. And the captain of the crew, Peter, he was the real fisherman. He, he had his own fisherman business uh, before he became a disciple of Jesus. And, and he said, Lord, if it's really you, bid me come to you on the water. Let me walk on the water. And Jesus said, come. And you can just picture it in your own mind. He stepped out of that boat, slipped down the side of that boat, got on that water, kept his eyes on Jesus. He was looking at Jesus. And as he did, he walked. But the Bible then says, first it says they saw Jesus walking. Peter was looking at Jesus. Then it says, and Peter saw the waves. He took his eyes off Jesus and looked at his circumstances. And he began to sink. And Jesus reached and caught him. You see, the difference between faith and fear is what we look at. It's focus. If the producer of peace is God, then the pathway to peace is focusing on him. Hebrews again Chapter 12, this time, verse 2 says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, the originator, and the perfecter, the completer, the alpha and the omega of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That means a place of power. Then it ends with this. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you'll not grow weary or lose heart. He went through all of that so that we could have his peace. So that he could transfer what was in him and put it inside of us. Now, I'm almost done. But I have one more. The producer of peace. The pathway to peace. And now, the principles of peace. There are only two of them. And I've, I've, I've found a text that encapsulates them both. But the first principle is this. It will cost you dearly not to trust in the Lord. It'll cost you your peace not to fix your eyes and your heart on the Lord. And number two, it will benefit you greatly if you do trust in the Lord. And here's that scripture. It's got them both. Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. Now, let's just work with this. And when I finish it, then I'm going to tell you one little story and we'll be done. Here's what that text says. This is what the Lord says against the same NIV. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who depends on flesh for his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Hmm. Cursed, not blessed. You see, blessing and cursing are positions, just like faith and sin are positions. 
just like life and death are positions in the Lord. And this one is blessed. And this one is cursed. Now, cursed doesn't mean damned to hell, of course. What it does mean, though, is alienated and separated from the blessing of God. The two don't coexist. Oh, they do in a sense, I, I grant you, because we are all a mixture, but, but dominantly blessing is the opposite of non-blessing. So cursed is the one who trusts in man, who depends on flesh for his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Now look at three things. He will be like a bush in a wasteland. Wow. You know, this Hebrew is, is, is a picturesque language. It's not a, a linear language like the Greek. It's a picture language. It gives you a series of, of snapshots. I love that. Whereas uh, Greek is a very rationalistic language. And we've got the gospel in both Hebrew and Greek. See, Now, he will be like a bush in a wasteland. Well, picture a tumbleweed. Of what value is a tumbleweed? He once had value. He once had roots. It once had soil. But now it's lost the soil that gave it life. It's tumbling here and there with every wind that blows. The one who trusts in man will wind up like a tumbleweed. Number two, he will not see prosperity when it comes. He will not see prosperity when it comes. You know, I've often said that poverty is between the ears. So is wealth. It's a thing of perception. It's a thing of focus. It's a thing of faith. Poverty and wealth. I know a lot of people who have lots and lots of money but they're not rich. They don't have wealth. They're insecure. They're afraid. They're caught up in all kinds of stuff. Business, pleasure, money. I know other people who have far less that are rich indeed. Because you see, he's the producer of peace. The pathway is focusing on him. Now there's a third one here. Cursed is the man who trusts in himself. Like a tumbleweed, he will not see prosperity when it comes. And he will dwell in the parched places of the desert. Watch this now in a salt land where nothing lives. In a salt land where nothing thrives. What a curse. And how many people do we all know who are living right there? They may have money everywhere, but they're so poor. On the other hand, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. And now look, he couldn't contain it all in three. He had to give us five things for this one. He says, he will be like a tree planted by water. Totally different from tumbleweed. Tree planted by water. Oh, yes, it's got a strong trunk and it's got great strong branches, but its real strength is in its root system because it's constantly feeding on the water. It sends out its roots by the stream. So it's always going to be 
fed, full, complete, shalom, shalom on the inside, regardless of what's going on around it. It does not fear when heat comes. Oh, the troubles can come. But my dependence is not on what's outside. My roots are sunk deep in the soil by the stream. Its leaves are always green. It's always green. It's always producing. And it has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. <laughs> ah, the prescription for peace. He's the producer. Trust is the pathway and fullness is the principle. Now this story. Story about Jimi Hendrix. A lot of people know about Jimi Hendrix. One of the, his word uh, synonymous with profligacy and, uh, and drugs and booze and women and gave his last concert. This is pretty well documented. And toward the end of that concert, he came down and he, and he went down on his knees, had his guitar in his hand, stood up, and smashed his guitar. Thousands and thousands of dollars for that instrument. Took it over and smashed it down on his knees. He said through the microphone system for the thousands who were there to hear. He says, does anybody really know peace? And he had everything. Money, fame, success, cars, homes. He had everything. Jets. Then he said, very weak voice. If you've got peace, please come to my dressing room after the concert's over. The curtain went down. People started to leave. Nobody came to his dressing room. Nobody. And he died that same week of a drug overdose. Peace. God said, I will keep you, maintain you, put you and maintain you in perfect peace if you'll just trust in me. Trust in me and I'll become your rock of ages. Your eternal rock. both in this life and the next. Prescription for peace. The doctor gives it to you today. I hope you'll take it. God bless you. I'll see you next time. This has been brought to you by Ron Cottle Ministries. For more information, please call us at 706-256-0100, extension 217 or visit our website, roncottleministries.com.